Hello. <laughs> um, my voice is very fucked up because I have been quite ill. It wasn't COVID though, so like, that's nice. I remain unsullied. Anyway, it's pretty bad, but I'm gonna read anyway. Um, I don't really know why, I just felt like it. Um, I'm gonna read Missouri and the Magician, which is the second story in the Jack Vance collection, Tales of the Dying Earth. Uh, this would come after Trajan of Mir. <clears throat> you know, I guess chronologically even. Boy, I feel like my voice is gonna bottom out in a bunch of random places, and it's just gonna be a fucking disaster. But we're gonna try it anyway. Give me a sec. Oh yeah, and today we're listening to um, the Winter Scriptures by Andalmadir. You, you know I love that guy, I love Andalmadir so much. I wish he would make another album, but you know, you gotta respect a man's creative time and privacy. I've had a little whiskey. <clears throat> Missouri and the Magician by Jack Vance. Deep in thought, Wazirian the magician walked his garden. Trees fruited with many intoxications overhung his path, and flowers bowed obsequiously as he passed. An inch above the ground, dull as agats, the eyes of mandrakes followed the tread of his black slippered feet. Such was Mazirian's garden. Three terraces, growing with strange and wonderful vegetations. Certain plants swam with changing iridescences. Others held up blooms pulsing like sea anemones. Purple, green, lilac, pink, yellow. Here grew trees like feather parasols. Trees with transparent trunks threaded with red and yellow veins. Trees with foliage like metal foil. Each leaf a different metal. Copper, silver, blue, tantalum, green, a uh, bronze, rather, green, iridium. Here, blooms like bubbles tugged gently upward from glazed green leaves. There, a shrub bore a thousand pipe-shaped blossoms, each whistling softly to make music of the ancient earth, of the ruby-red sunlight, water seeping through black soil, the languid winds. And beyond the rockal hedge, the trees of the forest made a tall wall of mystery. In this waning hour of Earth's life, no man could count himself familiar with the glens, the glades, the dells and deeps, the secluded clearings, the ruined pavilions, the sun-dappled plaisances, the gullies and heights, the various brooks, freshets, ponds, the meadows, thickets, breaks, and rocky outcrops. Mazirian paced his garden with a brow frowning in thought. His step was slow, and his arms were clenched behind his back. There was one who had brought him puzzlement, doubt, and a great desire. A delightful woman creature who dwelt in the woods. She came to his garden half laughing, and always wary, riding a black horse with eyes like golden crystals. Many times had Mazirian tried to take her. Always her horse had borne her from his varied enticements, threats, and subterfuges. Agonized screaming jarred the garden. Mazirian, hastening his step, found a mole chewing the stalk of a plant-animal hybrid. He killed the marauder, and the scream subsided to a dull gasping. Mazirian stroked a furry leaf and the red mouth hissed in pleasure. Then, k -k -k -k, spoke the plant. Mazirian stooped, held the rodent to the red mouth. The mouth sucked, the small body slid into the stomach bladder underground. The plant gurgled, eructated, and Mazirian watched with satisfaction. 
The sun had swung low in the sky, so dim and red that the stars could be seen. And now Mazirian felt a watching presence. It would be the woman of the forest, for thus had she disturbed him before. He paused in his stride, feeling for the direction of the gaze. He shouted a spell of immobilization. Behind him, the plant animal froze to rigidity, and a great green moth wafted to the ground. He whirled around. There she was, at the edge of the forest, closer than ever she had approached before. Nor did she move as he advanced. Mazirian's young old eyes shone. He would take her to his manse and keep her in a prison of green glass. He would test her brain with fire, with cold, with pain, and with joy. She would serve him with wine and make the eighteen motions of allurement by yellow lamplight. Perhaps she was spying on him. If so, the magician would discover immediately, for he could call no man friend and had forever to guard his garden. She was but twenty paces distant. Then there was a thud and the pound of black hooves as she wheeled her mount, and fled into the forest. The magician flung down his cloak in rage. She held a guard, a counterspell, a rune of protection, and always she came when he was ill-prepared to follow. He peered into the murky depths, glimpsed the wanness of her body flitting through a shaft of red light, then black shade, and she was gone. Was she a witch? Did she come of her own volition, or, more likely, had an enemy sent her to deal with his, uh, to deal him in quietude? If so, who might be guiding her? There was Prince Kandive the Golden of Cain, whom Mazirian had bilked of his secret of renewed youth. There was Asvan the Astronomer. There was Terjan, hardly Terjan, and here Mazirian's face lit in a pleasing recollection. He put the thought aside. Asvan, at least, he could test. He turned his steps to his workshop, went to a table where rested a cube of clear crystal shimmering with a red and blue aureole. From a cabinet, he brought a bronze gong and a silver hammer. He tapped on the gong, and the mellow tone sang through the room and out, away, and beyond. He tapped again and again. Suddenly, Asvan's face shone from the crystal, beaded with pain and great terror. "'Stay the strokes, Mazirian!' cried Asvan. "'Strike no more on the gong of my life!' Mazirian paused, his hand poised over the gong. "'Do you spy on me, Asvan? Do you send a woman to regain the gong?' "'Not I, master!' Not I. I fear you too well. You must deliver me the woman, Asvan. I insist. Impossible, master. I know not who or what she is. Mazirian made as if to strike. Asvan poured forth such a torrent of supplication that Mazirian, with a gesture of disgust, threw down the hammer and restored the gong to its place. Asvan's face drifted slowly away, and the fine cube of crystal shone blank as before. Mazirian stroked his chin. Apparently, he must capture the girl himself. Later, when Black Knight lay across the forest, he would seek through his books for spells to guard him through the unpredictable glades. They would be poignant, corrosive spells of such a nature that one would daunt the brain of an ordinary man and two render him mad. Mazirian, by dint of stringent exercise, could encompass four of the most formidable or six of the lesser spells. He put the project from his mind and went to a long vat bathed in a flood of green light. Under a wash of clear fluid lay the body of a man, ghastly, below the green glare, but of great physical beauty. His torso tapered from wide shoulders through lean flanks to long, strong legs and arched feet. His face was clean and cold with hard, flat features. Dusty golden hair clung about his head. 
Mazirian stared at the thing, which he had cultivated from a single cell. It needed only intelligence, and this he knew not how to provide. Terjan of Mir held the knowledge, and Terjan... Mazirian glanced with a grim narrowing of the eyes at a trap in the floor. Refused to part with his secret. Mazirian pondered the creature in the vat. It was a perfect body. Therefore, might not the brain be ordered and pliant? He would discover. He set in motion a device to draw off the liquid, and presently the body lay stark to the direct rays. Mazirian injected a minum of drug into the neck. The body twitched. The eyes opened, winced in the glare. Mazirian turned away the projector. Feebly, the creature in the vat moved its arms and feet, as if unaware of their use. Mazirian watched intently. Perhaps he had stumbled on the right synthesis for the brain. Sit up, commanded the magician. The creature fixed its eyes upon him, and reflexes joined muscle to muscle. It gave a throaty roar and sprang from the vat at Mazirian's throat. In spite of Mazirian's strength, it caught him and shook him like a doll. For all Mazirian's magic, he was helpless. The mesmeric spell had been expended, and he had none other in his brain. In any event, he could not have uttered the space-twisting syllables with that mindless clutch at his throat. His hand closed on the neck of a leaden carboy. He swung and struck the head of his creature, which slumped to the floor. Mazirian, not entirely dissatisfied, studied the glistening body at his feet. The spinal coordination had functioned well. At his table, he mixed a white potion and, lifting the golden head, poured the fluid into the lax mouth. The creature stirred, opened its eyes, propped itself on its elbows. The madness had left its face, but Mazurian sought in vain for the glimmer of intelligence. The eyes were as vacant as those of a lizard. The magician shook his head in annoyance. He went to the window and his brooding profile was cut black against the oval panes. Tujan once more? Under the most dire inquiry, Tojan had kept his secret close. Mazirian's thin mouth curved wryly. Perhaps if he inserted another angle into the passage. The sun had gone from the sky, and there was dimness in Mazirian's garden. His white night blossoms opened, and their captive gray moths fluttered from bloom to bloom. Mazirian pulled open the trap in the floor and descended stone stairs. Down, down, down. At last, a passage intercepted at right angles, lit with the yellow light of eternal lamps. To the left were his fungus beds. To the right, a stout oak and iron door, locked with three locks. Down and ahead, the stone steps continued, dropping into blackness. Mazirian unlocked the three locks, flung wide the door. The room within was bare, except for a stone pedestal supporting a glass-topped box. The box measured a yard on a side, and was four or five inches high. Within the box, actually a squared passageway, a run with right angles, moved two small creatures, one seeking, the other evading. The predator was a small dragon with furious red eyes and a monstrous fanged mouth. It waddled along the passage on six splayed legs, twitching its tail as it went. The other stood only half the size of the dragon, a strong-featured man, stark naked, with a copper fillet, uh, sorry, <laughs> with a copper fillet binding his long black hair. He moved slightly faster than his pursuer, which still kept relentless chase, using a measure of craft, speeding, doubling back, lurking at the angle in case the man should unwarily step around. By holding himself continually alert, the man was able to stay beyond the reach of the fangs. The man was Turjan, whom Mazirian, by trickery, had captured several weeks before, reduced in size, and thus imprisoned. I need a moment here to drink water. Well, 
Boy. Words are hard. <clears throat> All right, let's continue. Mazirian watched with pleasure as the reptile sprang upon the momentarily relaxing man who jerked himself clear by the thickness of his skin. It was time, Mazirian thought, to give both rest and nourishment. He dropped panels across the passage, separating it into halves, isolating man from beast. To both, he gave meat and pannikins of water. Turjan slumped in the passage. Ah, said Mazirian, you are fatigued. You desire rest? Turjan remained silent, his eyes closed. Time and the world had lost meaning for him. The only realities were the gray passage and the interminable flight. At unknown intervals came food and a few hours rest. I think maybe the music could be louder. Think of the blue sky, said Mazirian, the white stars, your castle mere by the river Derna. Think of wandering free in the meadows. The muscles at Turjan's mouth twitched. Consider you might crush the little dragon under your heel, he told him. Oh, pardon me. Turjan looked up. I would prefer to crush your neck, Mazirian. Mazirian was unperturbed. Tell me, how do you invest your vat creatures with intelligence? Speak, and you go free. Turjan laughed, and there was madness in his laughter. Tell you, and then you would kill me with hot oil in a moment. Mazirian's thin mouth drooped petulantly. Wretched man, I know how to make you speak. If your mouth were stuffed, waxed, and sealed, you would speak. Tomorrow I take a nerve from your arm and draw coarse cloth along its length. The small Turjan, sitting with his legs across the passageway, drank his water and said nothing. Tonight, said Mazirian, with studied malevolence, I add an angle and change your run to a pentagon. Turjan paused and looked up through the glass cover at his enemy. Then he slowly sipped his water. As do I. With five angles, there would be less time to evade the charge of the monster, less of the hall in view from one angle. Tomorrow, said Mazirian, you will need all your agility. But another matter occurred to him. He eyed Turjan speculatively. Yet even this I spare you, if you assist me with another problem. What is your difficulty, febrile magician? The image of a woman creature haunts my brain, and I would capture her. Mazirian's eyes went misty at the thought. Late afternoon, she comes to the edge of my garden, riding a great black horse. You know her, Turjan? Not I, Mazirian. Turjan sipped his water. Mazirian continued, She has sorcery enough to ward away Felosian's second hypnotic spell. Or perhaps she has some protective rune. When I approach, she flees into the forest. So then, asked Turjan, nibbling the meat Mazirian had provided. Who? May this woman be, demanded Mazirian, peering down his long nose at his tiny captive. Well, how could I say? I must capture her, 
said Mazirian, abstractedly. What spells? What spells? Trajan looked up, although he could see the magician only indistinctly through the cover of glass. Release me, Mazirian, and on my word as a chosen hierarch of the Maram Or, I will deliver you this girl. How would you do this? asked the suspicious Mazirian. I need more water. Pursue her into the forest with my best live boots and a head full of spells. You would fare no better than I, retorted the magician. I give you freedom when I know the synthesis of your vat things. I myself will pursue the woman. Terjan lowered his head that the magician might not read his eyes. And as for me... Mazirian, he inquired, after a moment. I will treat with you when I return. And if you do not return? Mazirian stroked his chin and smiled, revealing fine white teeth. The dragon could devour you now, if it were not for your cursed secret. The magician climbed the stairs. Midnight found him in his study, poring through leather-bound tomes and untidy portfolios. <laughs> I'm sorry, my diction is very weird because of the scratchiness of my throat, so I have to, like, sometimes put random emphasis behind syllables just to keep my voice alive. <clears throat> All right, more water. There we go. The magician climbed the stairs. Midnight found him in his study pouring through leather-bound tomes and untidy portfolios. At one time, a thousand or more runes, spells, incantations, curses, and sorceries had been known. The reach of Grand Mothalum, Ascalace, the Eid of Kashyyyk, Almeri to the south, the land of the Falling Wall to the east, swarmed with sorcerers of every description, of whom the chief was the Ark Necromancer, Fandal, a hundred spells Fandal personally had formulated through room oh sorry, though rumor said that demons whispered at his ear when he wrought magic. Ponte Chila, the pious, then ruler of Grand Mothalum, put Fandal to torment, and after a terrible night he killed Fandal and outlawed sorcery throughout the land. The wizards of Grand Mothalum fled like beetles under a strong light. The lore was dispersed and forgotten, until now, at this dim time, with the sun dark, wilderness obscuring Ascolace, and the white city Cain half in ruins, only a few more than a hundred spells remained to the knowledge of man. Of these, Mazirian had access to seventy-three, and gradually, by stratagem and negotiation, was securing the others. Hey, Raph. Thanks, I'm glad it's working out. <laughs> <clears throat> Mazirian made a selection from his books, and with great effort forced five spells upon his brain. Fandal's Gyrator, Felosian's second hypnotic spell, the excellent prismatic spray, the charm of untiring nourishment, and the spell of the omnipotent sphere. This accomplished, Mazirian drank wine and retired to his couch. Let me see how much longer this is, because I might need to break this up into a two-parter, judging by how... Oh, no. I, we got time. We're, we'll be okay. Just gotta take a lot of water breaks. The following day, when the sun hung low, Mazirian went to walk in his garden. He had but short time to wait. As he loosened the earth at the roots of his moon geraniums, a soft rustle and stamp 
told that the object of his desire had appeared. She sat upright in the saddle, a young woman of exquisite configuration. Mazirian slowly stooped as not to startle her, put his feet into the live boots, and secured them above the knee. He stood up. Oh, girl, he cried, you have come again. Why are you here of evenings? Do you admire the roses? They are vividly red because live red blood flows in their petals. If today you do not flee, I will make you the gift of one. Mazirian plucked a rose from the shuddering bush and advanced toward her, fighting the surge of the live boots. He had taken but four steps when the woman dug her knees into the ribs of her mount and so plunged off through the trees. Mazirian allowed full scope to the life in his boots. They gave a great bound, and another, and another, and he was off in full chase. So Mazirian entered the forest of fable. On all sides, mossy boles twisted up to support the high panoply of leaves. At intervals, shafts of sunshine drifted through to lay carmine blots on the turf. In the shade, long-stemmed flowers and fragile fungi sprang from the humus. In this ebbing hour of earth, nature was mild and relaxed. Is it carmine or carmine? Probably carmine, right? Mazirian in his live boots bounded with great speed through the forest, yet the black horse, running with no strain, stayed easily ahead. For several leagues the woman rode, her hair flying behind like a pennon. She looked back and Mazirian saw the face over her shoulder as a face in a dream. Then she bent forward. The golden-eyed horse thundered ahead and soon was lost to sight. Mazirian followed by tracing the trail in the sod. The spring and drive began to leave the live boots, for they had come far and at a great speed. The monstrous leaps became shorter and heavier, but the strides of the horse, shown by the tracks, were also shorter and slower. Presently, Mazirian entered a meadow and saw the horse riderless cropping grass. He stopped short. The entire expanse of tender herbage lay before him. The, before, even. The trail of the horse leading into the glade was clear, but there was no trail leaving. The woman, therefore, had dismounted somewhere behind. How far, he had no means of knowing. He walked toward the horse, but the creature shied and bolted through the trees. Mazirian made one effort to follow and discovered that his boots hung lax and flaccid. Dead. He kicked them away cursing the day and his ill fortune. Shaking the cloak free behind him, a baleful tension shining on his face, he started back along the trail. In this section of the forest, outcroppings of black and green rock, assaults and serpentine were frequent, forerunners of the crags over the river Derna. On one of these rocks, Mazirian saw a tiny man-thing mounted on a dragonfly. He had a skin of greenish cast. I'm sorry, that was a funny mistake. He had skin of a greenish cast. He wore a gauzy smock and carried a lance twice his own length. Mazirian stopped. The Twook man looked down stolidly. Have you seen a woman of my race passing by, Twook man? I have seen such a woman responded the Took man after a moment of deliberation. Where may she be found? What may I expect for the information? Salt, as much as you can bear away. The Took man flourished his lance. Salt? No, Liane the Wayfarer provides the chieftain Dandan Flores salt for all the tribe. Mazirian could surmise the services for which the bandit troubadour paid salt. The Took men, flying fast on their dragonflies, saw all that happened in the forest. Mmm, a vial of oil from my Talanxis blooms. 
Good, said the toque man. Show me the vial. Mazirian did so. Pardon. <clears throat> Gotta lubricate, you know. <laughs> she left the trail at the lightning blasted oak lying a little before you. She made directly for the river valley, the shortest route to the lake. Mazirian laid the vial beside the dragonfly and went off toward the river oak. The Took man watched him go, then dismounted and lashed the vial to the underside of the dragonfly, next to the skein of fine haft the woman had given him thus to direct Mazirian. All right, give me a sec. I, I gotta cough one out, you know? Boy, I can't wait to listen to this later and be like, holy Moses, what? Why did I do this? I'm just going to end up rereading this story like next week. <clears throat> Where was I? Ah, right. The magician turned at the oak and soon discovered the trail over the dead leaves. A long, open glade lay before him, sloping gently to the river. Yeah, it makes the voices funny, but I'm also like... <laughs> Like, the diction in some of these sentences is bonkers. Hang on. Also, hi, Ashley. <clears throat> oh, where was I? A long, open glade lay before him, sloping gently to the river. Trees towered to either side, and the long, sundown rays steeped one side in blood, left the other deep in black shadow. So deep was the shade that Mazirian did not see the creature seated on a fallen tree, and he sensed it only as it prepared to leap on his back. Mazirian sprang about to face the thing, which subsided again to sitting posture. It was a deodand, formed and featured like a handsome man, finely muscled but with a dead, black, lusterless skin and long, slit eyes. Ah, Mazirian. You roam the woods far from home. The black thing's soft voice rose through the glade. The Deodand, Mazirian knew, craved his body for meat. How had the girl escaped? Her trail led directly past. I come seeking, Deodand. Answer my questions, and I undertake to feed you much flesh. The Deodan's eyes glinted, flitting over Mazirian's body. You may, in any event, Mazirian. Are you with powerful spells today? I am. Tell me, how long has it been since the girl passed? Went she fast, slow, alone, or in company? Answer and I give you meat at such time as you desire. The Deodan's lips curled mockingly. Blind magician, she has not left the glade. He pointed, and Mazirian followed the direction of the dead black arm. But he jumped back as the Deodan sprang. From his mouth gushed the syllables of Fandal's Gyrador spell. The Deodand was jerked off his feet and flung high in the air, where he hung whirling, high and low, faster and slower, up to the treetops, low to the ground. Mazirian watched with a half-smile. After a moment, he brought the Deodand low and caused the rotations to slacken. "'Will you die quickly or slow?' asked Mazirian. Help me, and I kill you at once. Otherwise, you shall rise high where the pale green fly. Fury and fear choked the Deodan. May dark the owl spike your eyes. May Cran hold your living brain in acid. And it added such charges that Mazirian felt forced to mutter counter curses. Up, then said Mazirian at last with a wave of his hand. 
the black sprawling body jerked high above the treetops to revolve slowly in the crimson bask of setting sun. In a moment, a mottled, bat-shaped thing with a hooked snout swept close, and its beak tore the black leg. Before the crying Deodan could kick it away, another and another of the shapes flitted across the sun. Down, Mazirian, came the faint call. I tell what I know. All right, I need a minute. I got to get more water. I'll be back in like, I don't know, a minute. Oh, yeah, I just juiced up that flesh corridor. Mm -mm -mm. All right. <clears throat> ah, no breaks. I'm almost done. Uh, at least I think I'm almost done. Well, yeah, kind of. We'll get there. Don't worry about it. I'll survive. Yeah, but it is, it, it, it's fun, though. The voices are fun. All right. Um, hang tight. Where was I? Oh, yeah. The Deodan said he wants to come down. Mazirian brought him close to Earth. She passed alone before you came. I made to attack her, but she repelled me with a handful of thyle dust. She went to the end of the glade and took the trail to the river. This trail leads also past the lair of Thrang. So is she lost... For he will sate himself on her till... Oh, I'm sorry. He will sate himself on her till she dies. Mazirian rubbed his chin. Hmm. Had she spells with her? I know not. She will need strong magic to escape the demon Thrang. Is there anything else to tell? Nothing. Then you may die. And Mazirian caused the creature to revolve at ever greater speed, faster and faster, until there was only a blur. A strangled wailing came, and presently the Deodan's frame parted. The head shot like a bullet far down the glade. Arms, legs, viscera flew in all directions. Mazirian went his way. At the end of the glade, the trail led steeply down ledges of dark green serpentine to the river Derna. The sun had set and shade filled the valley. Mazirian gained the riverside and set off downstream toward a far shimmer known as Sanra Water, the Lake of Dreams. An evil odor came to the air, a stink of putrescence and filth. Mazirian went ahead more cautiously, for the lair of Thrang, the ghoul bear, was near, and in the air was the feel of magic, strong, brutal sorcery his own more subtle spells might not contain. <clears throat> the sound of voices reached him, the throaty tones of Thrang and gasping cries of terror. Mazurian stepped around a shoulder of rock, inspected the origin of the sounds. Thrang's lair was an alcove in the rock where a fetid pile of grass and skin served him for a couch. He had built a rude pen to cage three women, these wearing many bruises on their bodies and the effects of much horror on their faces. Thrang had taken them from the tribe that dwelt in the silk-hung barges along the lake shore. Now they watched as he struggled to subdue the woman he had just captured. His round, gray man's face was contorted, and he tore away her jerkin with his human hands. Mazirian's eyes narrowed. 
Magic. Magic. So he stood watching, considering how to destroy Thrang with no harm to the women. But she spied him over Thrang's shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry to clarify. The woman, not the women. I don't think Mazirian cares about the other women at all. See, she panted, Mazirian has come to kill you. Thrang twisted about. He saw Mazirian and came charging on all fours, venting roars of wild passion. Mazirian later wondered if the ghoul had cast some sort of spell, for a strange paralysis strove to bind his brain. Perhaps the spell lay in the sight of Thrang's raging gray-white face, the great arms thrust outwards to grasp. Mazirian shook off the spell, if such it were, and uttered a spell of his own, and all the valley was lit by streaming darts of fire, lashing in from all directions to split Thrang's blundering body in a thousand places. Boy, that was really hard to eke that sentence out. This was the excellent prismatic spray, many-colored stabbing lines. Thrang was dead almost at once, purple blood flowing from countless holes where the radiant rain had pierced him. But Mazirian heeded little. The girl had fled. Mazirian saw her white form running along the river toward the lake and took up the chase, heedless of the piteous cries of the three women in the pen. The lake presently lay before him, a great sheet of water whose further rim was but dimly visible. Mazirian came down to the sandy shore and stood seeking across the dark face of Sandra Water, the lake of dreams. Deep night with only a verge of afterglow ruled the sky, and stars glistened on the smooth surface. The water lay cool and still, tideless as all Earth's waters had been since the moon had departed the sky. Where was the woman? There, a pale white form, quiet in the shadow across the river. Mazirian stood on the riverbank, tall and commanding, a light breeze ruffling the cloak around his legs. Oh, girl, he called, it is I, Mazirian, who saved you from Thrang. Come close, that I may speak to you. At this distance I hear you well, magician, she replied. The closer I approach, the farther I must flee. Why, then, do you flee? Return with me, and you shall be mistress of many secrets, and hold much power. She laughed. If I wanted these, Mazirian, would I have fled so far? Who are you, then, that you desire not the secrets of magic? To you, Mazirian, I am nameless, lest you curse me. Now I go where you may not come. She ran down the shore, waded slowly out till the water circled her waist, then sank out of sight. She was gone. Mazirian paused indecisively. It was not good to use so many spells and thus shear himself of power. What might exist below the lake? A sense of quiet magic was there. And though he was not at enmity with the Lake Lord, other beings might resent a trespass. However, when the figure of the girl did not break the surface, he uttered the charm of untiring, I'm sorry, untiring nourishment and entered the cool waters. He plunged deep through the Lake of Dreams, and as he stood on the bottom, his lungs at ease, by virtue of the charm, he marveled at the fey place he had come upon. Instead of blackness, a green light glowed everywhere, and the water was but little less clear than air. Plants undulated to the current, and with them moved the lake flowers, soft with blossoms of red, blue, and yellow. In and out swam large-eyed fish, of many shapes. 
The bottom dropped by rocky steps to a wide plain where trees of the underlake floated up from slender stalks to elaborate fronds and purple water fruits, and so till the misty wet distance veiled all. He saw the woman, a white water nymph now, her hair like dark fog. She half swam, half ran across the sandy floor of the water world, occasionally looking back over her shoulder. Mazirian came after, his cloak streaming out behind. Just a moment. He drew nearer to her, exulting. He must punish her for leading him so far. The ancient stone stairs below his workroom led deep, and at last opened into chambers that grew ever vaster as one went deeper. Mazirian had found a rusted cage in one of these chambers. A week or two locked in the blackness would curb her willfulness, and once he had dwindled a woman small as his thumb and kept her in a little glass bottle buzzing with two flies. A ruined white temple showed through the green, there were many columns, some toppled, some still upholding the pediment. The woman entered the great portico under the shadow of the architrave. Perhaps she was attempting to elude him. He must follow closely. The white body glimmered at the far end of the nave, swimming now over the rostrum and into a semicircular alcove behind. Mazirian followed as fast as he was able, half swimming, half walking through the solemn dimness. He peered across the murk. Smaller columns here precariously upheld a dome from which the keystone had dropped. A sudden fear smote him, then realization as he saw the flash of movement from above. On all sides the columns toppled in, and an avalanche of marble blocks tumbled at his head. He jumped frantically back. The commotion ceased. The white dust of the ancient mortar drifted away. On the pediment of the main temple, the woman kneeled on slender knees, staring down to see how well she had killed Mazirian. She had failed. Two columns, by sheerest luck, had crashed to either side of him, and a slab had protected his body from the blocks. He moved his head painfully. Through a chink in the tumbled marble, he could see the woman leaning to discern his body. So... She would kill him. He, Mazirian, who had already lived more years than he could easily reckon. So much more would she hate and fear him later. He called his charm the spell of the omnipotent sphere. A film of force formed around his body, expanding to push aside all that resisted. When the marble ruins had been thrust back, he destroyed the sphere, regained his feet, and glared about for the woman. She was almost out of sight, behind a break of long purple kelp, climbing the slope to the shore. With all his power, he set out in pursuit. All right, we have a page break here, so I'm going to drink more water. <clears throat> Syene dragged herself up on the beach. Still behind her came Mazirian the Magician, whose power had defeated each of her plans. The memory of his face passed before her and she shivered. He must not take her now. Fatigue and despair slowed her feet. She had set out with but two spells, the charm of untiring nourishment and a spell affording strength to her arms, the last permitting her to hold off Thrang and tumble the temple upon Mazirian. These were exhausted. She was bare of protection, but on the other hand, Mazirian could have nothing left. Perhaps he was ignorant of the vampire weed. She ran up the slope and stood behind a patch of pale, wind-beaten grass. And now Mazirian came from the lake, a spare form visible against the shimmer of the water. She retreated, keeping the innocent patch of grass between them. If the grass failed, her mind quailed at the thought of what she must do. I need more water. <laughs> <clears throat> Mazirian strode into the grass. The sickly blades became sinewy fingers. They twined about his ankles, holding him in an unbreakable grip while others sought to find his skin. So, Mazirian chanted his last spell, 
the incantation of paralysis, and the vampire grass grew lax and slid limply to earth. Tsayin watched with dead hope. He was now close upon her, his cloak flapping behind. Had he no weakness? Did not his fibers ache? Did not his breath come short? She whirled and fled across the meadow toward a grove of black trees, her skin chilled at the deep shadows, the somber frames. But the thud of the magician's feet was loud. She plunged into the dread shade. Before all in the grove awoke, she must go as far as possible. Snap! A thong lashed at her. She continued to run. Another and another. She fell. Another great whip and another beat at her. She staggered up and on, holding her arms before her face. Snap! The flails whistled through the air and the last blow twisted her around. So she saw Mazirian. He fought. As the blows rained on him, he tried to seize the whips and break them, but they were supple and springy beyond his powers and jerked away to beat at him again. Infuriated by his resistance, they concentrated on the unfortunate magician who foamed and fought with transcendent fury, and Syene was permitted to crawl to the edge of the grove with her life. She looked back in awe at the expression of Mazirian's lust for life. He staggered about in a cloud of whips, his furious, obstinate figure dimly silhouetted. He weakened and tried to flee, and then he fell. The blows pelted at him, on his head, shoulders, the long legs. He tried to rise, but fell back. Tain closed her eyes in lassitude. She felt the blood oozing from her broken flesh. But the most vital mission yet remained. She reached her feet and reelingly set forth. For a long time, the thunder of many blows reached her ears. Mazirian's garden was surpassingly beautiful by night. The star blossoms spread wide, each of magic perfection, and the captive, half vegetable moths flew black, flew there. Wow, flew back and forth. Phosphorescent water lilies floated like charming faces on the pond, and the bush which Mazirian had brought from fall from far Almeri in the south tinctured the air with sweet, fruity perfume. Syene, weaving and gasping, now came groping through the garden. Certain of the flowers awoke and regarded her curiously. The half-animal hybrid sleepily chittered at her, thinking to recognize Mazirian's step. Faintly to be heard was the wistful music of the blue-cupped flowers, singing of ancient nights when a white moon swam the sky, and great storms and clouds and thunder ruled the seasons. Tsain passed unheeding. She entered Mazirian's house, found the workroom where glowed the eternal yellow lamps. Mazirian's golden-haired vat thing sat up suddenly and stared at her with his beautiful, vacant eyes. She found Mazirian's keys in the cabinet and managed to claw open the trap door. Here, she slumped to rest and let the pink gloom pass from her eyes. Visions began to come. Mazirian, tall and arrogant, stepping out to kill Thrang, the strange-hued flowers under the lake. Mazirian, his magic lost, fighting the whips. She was brought from the half-trance by the vat thing, timidly fumbling with her hair. She shook herself awake and half-walked, half-fell down the stairs. She unlocked the thrice-bound door, thrust it open with almost the last desperate urge of her body. She wandered in to clutch at the pedestal where the glass-topped box stood, and Terjan and the dragon were playing their desperate game. She flung the glass crashing to the floor, gently lifted Terjan out, and set him down. The spell was disrupted by the touch of the rune at her wrist, and Terjan became a man again. He looked aghast at the nearly unrecognizable Syene. 
She tried to smile up at him. Trajan, you are free. And Mazirian? He is dead. She slumped wearily to the stone floor and lay limp. Trajan surveyed her with an odd emotion in his eyes. Tyene, dear creature of my mind, he whispered, more noble are you than I, who used the only life you knew for my freedom. He lifted her body in his arms. But I shall restore you to the vats. With your brain, I build another Tyene, as lovely as you. We go. He bore her up the stone stairs. Uh, that's it. The next short story in the Tales of the Dying Earth is about Sain's sister, Sais, uh, who encounters Liane the Wayfarer. Um, I already read Liane the Wayfarer a while ago. It's on YouTube, um, but I think it might be from like before I had a good mic. So, you know, who knows? I don't know. Um, hey, Ashley and Raph, thanks for chilling. Uh, if anyone else listens to this, then good job. I'm surprised. <laughs> All right, dudes, I'm heading out. Um, I'll see you next week when I reread this story. <laughs> Bye.